And I feel like our focus should be on the now and in the future so that we can come together and not look at the other as the enemy, because there is a, an evil dark force that wants us to look at each other and point the finger. We should not be doing that. It is pointless. It is a waste of time. You, I, I feel like we're wasting time. We need to focus on loving God, loving each other, putting the stuff that's in the past in the past and fixing things at the root cause of why things are the way they are. Mention. Welcome back, Warriors. It's me, Linda B. Thank you all so much for joining me here today. So today I have more Thomas Sowell, and it's going to be Thomas Sowell versus Trevor Noah. You know, the comedian. So it's Thomas Sowell versus Trevor Noah on reparations. So before we get started, I want to remind you to please like, comment, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, watch the video all the way to the end. Also follow me on Rumble, chat with me, Linda B, but type it in, it's all one word. And you can also email me at chatwithmelindab at gmail.com. And I'm also on social media as chat with me, Linda B on X, TikTok, and Instagram. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. So questions, to your question, I think you have to understand what the word reparations means first. So reparations, you are repairing something that you have broken. You are paying for something that you were supposed to pay for. I'm not saying that there aren't people living in America today who are suffering and are going through pain and strife because of what's happening when it comes to, um, you know, the machines taking jobs, uh, factories becoming industrialized, etc. But reparations is a specific conversation about a specific time in America, and that is black people were slaves. Article that got a lot of attention in the Atlantic a couple of years ago called The Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Quote, white supremacy is a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it. Reparations is the price we must pay to see ourselves squarely. Close quote. And Tom Sowell, who actually saw Jim Crow with his own eyes and experienced it, responds, how? It would be nice to know his uh, evidence for what he said, just to be old fashioned about it. Uh, no, it, 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 it was a rotten system. But I don't know how, how, how we get from that to reparations. I mean, what we see in the United States in terms of the bad things, you see all around the world. If you were to give reparations to everyone whose ancestors had been slaves, I suspect that you would have to give reparations to more than half the entire population of the globe. Slavery was not confined to one set of races. I suspect that most of the people who were either slaves or slave owners around the world were neither white nor black. I mean, this was, this was a universal curse of the human species. Africa, the Middle East, Asia, all oh, and, 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 and it continued elsewhere long after. Uh, it, it was abolished in the Western countries. Right. You know what I mean? It, I've even heard people say like, oh, but there were some of the Irish who were indentured. Like, yeah, let's slavery. Look at the numbers, look at the time, look at the level of work. You could not work toward your freedom. For most black people in America, this was a time when you were, that was it, you lived and died as a slave. And so that's what reparations is about. The other thing, I have a slight um, sidebar in the, on the history of slavery. Mm -hmm. The history of slavery, slavery existed all over the world for thousands of years among all sorts of people as far back as the history of the human species goes. It's one of many evils that the left tries to localize when, when in fact it is, a, it is a universal evil. But more than that, as much as slavery is repudiated around the world today, prior to the 18th century, I know of no serious effort to abolish the institution anywhere. 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 Not in Africa, not in, not oh, in the Arabian Not world. in Africa in the 21st century. Mm. Uh, Adam Smith wrote in 1776 that the only place in the world where slavery had been abolished completely was Western Europe. So reparations keeps coming up. And usually it's folks who are on the left that feel like in order to repair the wrongs that have been done, the only way you can do it is for reparations. And typically they mean financial reparations, a certain amount of money. Um, 
I'm going to let you all tell me how you feel about reparations. If you've seen my other videos, you already know how I feel, but I'm going to try and hold back how I really feel about reparations and let, let this play out a little bit more before I give what I really feel about it. But reparations, I get it and to a degree because some people are going to say, well, Black people were the only ones that were slaves on American soil. You know, you're talking about American reparations. We're not talking about Europe and Africa and the Middle East where there was slavery all over the world. People, you know, Blacks in Africa enslaved their own people. Arabians enslaved their own people. Europeans, the same. There were Irish slaves on American soil, however. Now, I'm not saying the numbers were to the extent of the Black African slaves. I'm not saying that. But there were white slaves on American soil. And there were also free people of color, Black people on American soil. So I get, I agree that slavery was a horrible institution. The transatlantic slave trade, I agree. I totally agree. But is reparations the answer? <laughs> is it the answer though? I started to say how I really feel, but I'm going to hold that to the end of the video. So you guys stick around, but I understand how slavery is looked at as this horrible evil. It is a horrible evil. I agree that it was wrong. Let's continue to see what Dr. Soul says. Uh, and so this was as late as as late as the as late as the year this country was founded. Yes. And so the idea that this is something that the United States had that nobody else had or, or the other, other countries that didn't have, uh, it's been estimated that there are more slaves in India than in the entire Western Hemisphere. And that's quite, and that's before and after Columbus got here. Right. Uh, and so I hear what you're saying, but I think that's a completely separate conversation that needs to be had about the now. Because if you, if you are not careful what you then do is you combine everybody's suffering into the same ball and you make it seem like all injustices have the same weighting and they don't just like crimes you know theft isn't the same as murder we don't try them the same way and as much as there is a white person who's suffering today i feel for anybody who's suffering because i know what it's like to be poor i know what it's like to suffer i didn't come from a wealthy family we struggled when i was growing up but i also understand that there are levels of that suffering you know, and so sometimes white people, it, it does, it does block a white person because you go white privilege and a person goes, I'm poor and I'm white. Where's the privilege? You know, white people are like, I wish I could activate my white privilege. I wish I could do it right now. White privilege. Give me something. <laughs> I, I get that. I get that. Trust me. I get it. It is hard to accept that you have benefits because of the color of your skin. If you cannot see the benefits that you have. The book that I'm writing now, I, I discovered this is true, not only in the United States, uh, it's true in England. And the, and the situation is wholly different. And yet, if you read uh, the, the data, for example, from, from uh, London, the, the, the uh, educational tests and so forth, you see that uh, there, uh, immigrants from Africa uh, pass this test they have. Uh, I'm talking about low-income people now. Uh, six, nearly 60% of the time. Uh, uh, blacks from uh, the Caribbean, like 50%, so on. Native-born whites in the same low income bracket pass this test 30% of the time. Uh, and it's the same thing. The, the foreign people come in, they haven't had generations of being steeped in the welfare state vision, the vision of grievances, victimology, and resentments, and the idea that there are enemies out there dedicated to keeping you down. That's the, that, that's the message that's been pumped into the head of the of the white lower class in Britain. And that's the uh, the image that's been pumped into the black low income people in the United States. And the and the results are the same in both cases. But the thing I try to explain to a person is think of it more like golf. Don't think of it as privilege then think of it like a handicap. Right? In golf they acknowledge that you are in a position where you need so many advantages to be competitive in the game. Is that is that we ought not to be doing this? You know, there are, there are various uh, laws and policies that benefit one group at the expense of another. But I think uh, affirmative action has the distinction of being one that it harms everybody, though in different ways. And so you, 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 there, there, there's a lot of evidence that there are black kids who have all the qualifications to be successes in college, who nevertheless are failures because they are systematically mismatched with institutions 
whose standards they don't meet, even though they may meet the standards of 80 or 90 percent of the colleges in America. I remember I first aware of this when I was teaching at Cornell, and I found that half the black students at Cornell were on some kind of academic probation. And so I went over to the administration building and looked up the SATs of these students. The average black student at Cornell at that time scored at the 75th percentile. Which had, is pretty darn good. Yes. And so that means that in, that in most colleges in this country, they would have no trouble, and many of them would be on the dean's list. But at Cornell, the average uh, liberal arts student at that time was in the 99th percentile. And, and, when, you, when, you, and when you're teaching the students, students like that, uh, you teach at a pace that most people of any race cannot keep up with. And I, I was, it was always complained that I was assigning all kinds of uh, reading. But heck, you know, I'm teaching kids who are in the top 1%. They can, they, they can keep up with, it, with the reading that I'm right. assigning. Uh, so Cornell was taking very talented black kids and spending four years teaching them to feel inadequate. Yes, su and succeeding at that. Mm. Right. So what they say is you have a handicap of 15. So that means like you're going to be hitting from this tee and you get more chances to get the ball in because we understand the position you're in. And if you're a black person in America from slavery, from day one, pondering all this. Sometimes I just don't know what to say. <laughs> I do hear Trevor Noah's argument and I hear Dr. Thomas Sowell's argument on this reparations. What I will say is I don't feel like it is beneficial to anyone to focus on the injustices of the past and to the detriment of focusing on what is actually going on right now. We have to ask ourselves, will it benefit anyone um, to just be given a lump of money and some of which the, some people won't even know how to ha still have that money or make it grow? And then how do you determine who to give the money to? How do you logistically make that happen? I mean, I did a video with white liberals, black conservatives, and everybody agreed that how would you logistically make that happen with the reparations? And you, it might cause people to be a little bit upset with each other, possibly because they realize they're going to be paying it's got to come, the money's got to come from somewhere. Where is it coming from? You know, you don't want people saying, I don't want to pay for something that happened that I didn't have anything to do with. So it could possibly cause strife. And to me, anything that could cause strife is a problem. We need to focus on how we can better get these children in these poor neighborhoods better educated so they can be prepared when they leave high school. To me, that is a rep. I guess you could look at it as a reparation, maybe that would help that would have a longer lasting, helpful effect rather than just giving people money and you don't correct the problems at the root cause. It's like putting a Band-Aid on someone on something that actually needs surgery. We can't put a Band-Aid when it needs surgery. So at a holistic level, surgically speaking, you want to fix the public school system. You want to take crime out of the neighborhoods, put the fathers back in the home. When these things happen, everything else tends to fall into place. More importantly, morals need all over the world with, with any group of people not focusing on any particular ethnicity at all, just the human race. It's a human thing. We've fallen away from God and therefore, you know, our morals are not really what they should be, just, just keeping it honest and for real, not judging. You know, we all fall short, myself definitely included. I definitely fall short. So we need to focus on God. And then when we do that, we'll see things, I think, more clearly, except through, except a lot of people are seeing it through the lens of, you know, I'm seeing it through the lens of you owe me, you did, your ancestors did my ancestors wrong. I mean, People walking around today, and I know this is me getting into how I really feel about reparations. I was trying to hold it until the end, and I can't do it. You are blaming someone in a way for something that their ancestors did because their ancestors have supposedly their ancestors, not all white people own slaves. 
that's not true. But supposedly their ancestors owned slaves, you know, according to a lot of people who see things a certain way. Then you're making them pay for something that happened way in the past that's been over with. And I feel like our focus should be on the now and in the future so that we can come together and not look at the other as the enemy because there is a an evil dark force that wants us to look at each other and point the finger. We should not be doing that. It is pointless. It is a waste of time. You, I, I feel like we're wasting time. We need to focus on loving God, loving each other, putting the stuff that's in the past in the past and fixing things at the root cause of why things are the way they are. Mentioning that, you know, the black students were able to go to almost any school, but they were artificially implanted into schools that they could not keep up with the pace. And any student of any background is going to be hard to keep up with the pace, you know, if they're artificially placed. And, um, you know, you've got this thing called DEI that is going around artificially and placing placing people to try and come up with a diversity of bodies, but no diversity of thought. So just look deeper into these so-called CRTs, DEIs, and though they sell it to us as something good, look further into it to see what it is really about. So I, I noticed something, a, a column that you wrote, this is a couple of years ago, in which you rebutted Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times. And Kristof had ascribed the gaps between African-Americans and whites in America, gaps in wealth, gaps in educational achievement, the usual gaps, mm -hmm to, and this is a quotation from Christoph, to the lingering effects of slavery, close quote. Oh, yes. And here's Tom Sowell, quote, if we wanted to be serious about evidence, <laughs> we might compare where blacks stood 100 years after the end of slavery with where they stood after 30 years of the liberal welfare state. In other words, we could compare hard evidence on the legacy of slavery with hard evidence on the legacy of liberals. Close quote. And so the number of injustices that have held black people back in America amount to an insurmountable. Like you, you look at you look at black people's freedom, you look at black people's land, just just land alone. The amount of wealth you can you can acquire over time if you own land is exponential because you have the land, you have the fact that you can borrow based on the land, you have the fact that you can use the money that you have borrowed to grow more wealth, you can use it to grow your family's wealth. Just taking that away from black people alone. Right, right. And also, if so, if you think you've been done, if you think you've been wrong, your recourse might also be more likely to politics to try to to try to redress this whole redistribution. Yes. Oh, yeah. Rather than hit the books, acquire the skills, get the well, job. And, and, and but the other thing, too, I, one of the my favorite uh, statistic in there is that uh, the poverty rate among blacks as a whole is 22 percent. Mm -hmm. Among whites as a whole is 11 percent. And among black married couples is 7.5 percent. So, so and, it's been, and, and black married couples have never had a, a poverty rate as high as 10 percent in any year since 1994. All right. So to the to the to the cry, what is to be done? Tom Sowell answers. It's been done. Get an education, stay married, get married, have kids after you get married. That that's sort of the answer, right? Well, yes, and the things that work for other people work, work, tend, tend to work pretty generally. <laughs> All right. Is crippling them, and so you combine that with slavery, and then you look at Jim Crow laws. You didn't let black people in America live in the areas that they wanted to live in. They couldn't get loans from the banks that they wanted to get loans from. And then on top of that, when they started getting the loans from American banks, American banks were found to be giving them higher interest rates when, in fact, they were the same risk as many of the other races that they were they were, they were giving loans to. So when you combine all of those things, I think it's safe to say that black Americans have a conversation that they need to be having with the United States. The Fact check on that was false. <laughs> Did you all see that? <laughs> doesn't involve me. Doesn't involve white people. Doesn't. It's like it's like yo, American government meet the black people. That's it. <laughs> Have that conversation. In terms of political leaders, all the all the incentives politically are for, for black leaders to blame all problems in the black community on the larger society, and that enables them to take on the role of being the defender of the black community against enemies. 
which in turn uh, creates the situation in which many blacks don't feel that anything that they do is going to is going to help themselves unless it's done politically as as a group. That there's no point. I mean, why why would you if you believe what the, what that's what they say? Why would you want to knock yourself out in the school knowing that the man is not going to let you get anywhere? Well, I, one of the most pathetic things I heard in recent years was a young black man saying that you know at one point he thought he would join the Air Force and become a pilot, and then he says he realized that. The white man is not going to let a black man become a pilot. And he was saying this decades after the Tennessee Airmen had established their reputation in combat in Europe. You know, but, he, but the hopelessness, hopelessness is, is one of the big products of the, of the race industry, that, that you, have, you have no chance. This is what I have a problem with, with things that are, that the left does and the propaganda or mainstream media, whatever you want to call it, the race baiting, you know, there's the man is trying to keep you down. He's saying that the white man is not going to let him become an airman, even after the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, and their success. No one can stop you with God on your side and a good work ethic. That is just a fact. There were successful people. We had Black Wall Street. We had, you know, Anyone, no matter, it can be done. So when you keep telling people that there's white privilege and you can't make it because they're going to get because of their white privilege, I, I some white people are going to be like, well, I'm poor and why, where's my white privilege? I wish I could activate it. And I take that from Trevor. No, I wish I could activate it right now. I don't think that's really what it is. And so I think it's ridiculous that you can let someone tell you you can't do something and you take on this hopeless thing and say, well, I can't do it because they won't let me. What do you mean? God is bigger than a person. So you believe in God and you work hard, work, work. You will get there eventually. Yes, you will. Do not believe the lies. That's why all this race stuff coming from the left has people um, falsely falsely thinking that something there is keeping them down and they won't be able to make it. The evil powers that be are pressing on me and I won't be able to do what I want to do with my life anyway. So I won't even try. That's the deception in it. That is the deception of that woke stuff. You know, the powers that be are oppressing you. They're the oppressor. And you, you're a victim. You're a victim. You are oppressed. You are oppressed. Don't you dare believe you are oppressed and that you are a victim. You are an overcomer. You are a child of God, period. That's a lie. I'm not a victim. I can be whatever I want to be. My mother told me that when I was very young. She said, you can be whatever you want to be in your life. I love that woman. <laughs> I remember giving a talk at Marquette. And at the end of the talk, among the questions that was asked, a young, again, young black man got up and he said, even though I am graduating from Marquette uh, University, what hope is there for me? And uh, having gone through college when I was in the 50s, I don't remember any blacks on the, saying that in the 1950s, when there was a lot more obstacles to overcome than there were when this guy is graduating from Marquette. But you, but you have to pr pr produce that kind of feeling in order to serve the interests of those in the race industry. Somewhere watching this interview, there's a young Thomas Sowell. There's an African-American who's smart and wants to do something with his life. What's, it seems to me, I've all, we've already got one piece of advice you'd offer to him is stay away from the, from the races industry. Stay away from the, what, race what, ad, what advice, race hustlers, what advice would you give a young Thomas Sowell? How do you make something of yourself as an African-American in America today? The way anybody else would. You equip yourself with skills that people are willing to pay for. See, there you have it. You equip yourself with skills that people are willing to pay for. None of this hopeless stuff, none of this hopeless stuff, you know, what hope is there? I'm black, I can't do it, they won't let me. Oh, squash that. Too many successful black people that I know, anybody, no matter what you look like, you can be successful, no matter your background, no matter if you didn't have two nickels to rub together. You've seen people come to this country with nothing but the clothes on their back and a hope and a dream, and they made it. They are successful. So 
anybody under the sound of my voice. I'm not just talking to any particular group of people. I'm talking to humans right now, all humans. You can be successful. You can. You just have God on your side and work hard. Don't dare think, well, I can't do it. I'm this. I'm too female. I'm too black. I'm too old. I'm this and that. Uh-uh. Don't do that. That's a lie from the state, from the devil. That's a lie from the devil. Don't do that. Now, I will say this about reparations. I want to say something else about rep reparations. Again, for those that are pro-reparation, how logistically would we be able, would you would we be able to, as a country, hand out reparations for these societal ills that happened a long time ago? How would we logistically successfully do that without upsetting anybody? How would we logistically, would that fix the crumbling public school system and the breakdown of the family and other things by just giving someone some money? I feel like that that money could be better served with making sure that the public school systems work properly, that we um, don't just put people on welfare, that we get them the skills that they need to take care of themselves rather than depending on the government, putting fathers back in the home, keeping the family unit, the nuclear family together. That is where it is. God, family, country. That is where it is. Not just giving someone some money because most people don't even know what to do with money anyway. You know, you give them a bunch, the bunch, a bunch of money, then they are broke within like six months. And then you still have the same issues that are plaguing the neighborhoods and plaguing, you know, all across America in these large cities, the crime rate, the drug use and the, Ill, you know, babies born out of wetlock and the illiteracy rate. Money won't fix that. You got to go about it another way. That's my opinion. Well, that's it for today's video. You all be blessed. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell. As I always say, march on, warriors.